What is going on guys? Welcome back to another video with me, Ben Rokejohn, aka The Seattle Data Guy. Today, I wanted to review a subject that I kind of put together a while ago on a previous video, which is the harsh realities of being a data engineer. Now, I'm going to do this because a lot of people always ask, you know, should I become a data engineer? Is it the right role for me? And things similar to those types of questions. So I wanted to cover some of the harsh realities of being a data engineer, because at the end of the day, a lot of the work you're gonna do might not always be exhilarating. It might not always involve you working on big data systems. And a lot of it might just be migration from one platform to another. And this isn't always exciting. Let's start with the fact that in general, most software engineers just don't care about data. Now, let me be clear. Obviously one, this is a massive generalization and two, I mean more in terms of analytical purposes. Most of the time, if you're a data engineer, you're pulling data from various sources, many of which are often being built by software engineers who, if they're being judged or have reviews that are all geared on their ability to deliver new features and functionality, don't always pay attention to how those new features and functionality could possibly break your data pipelines. And this is why we see a lot about data contracts kind of coming out because there are a lot of people that could be producing data. And I'm saying software engineers, but honestly, it's not just them, it's general data producers. For example, if you work on Salesforce and you're a person who's maybe adding uh, new features and columns in terms of trying to track new information or maybe taking away um, previous information from uh, different Salesforce objects, you could also possibly break data pipelines. So really it's more general to say that a lot of data producers don't always necessarily care or at the very least know that if they make these small changes, they will drastically impact your life as a data engineer. Again, this is why data contracts are becoming a thing. I feel like I'm seeing this pop up everywhere from various newsletters to new startups to LinkedIn posts all about this because everyone knows that this is a problem. When I was at Facebook, we had to develop a whole system that basically automatically looked and scanned to see if uh, tables changed um, from your sources to make sure you knew that, hey, this table you're relying on uh, is no longer the same. You know, some field has changed, some data type has changed, something similar to that. So there is no way to sugarcoat it. A lot of your work is going to be just stuck spending time trying to fix all of these small changes that someone else produces. On top of that, I feel like I've had a few conversations now with various heads of data where they discussed how in previous companies, they were all trying to remove data engineering. Somehow they wanted to get rid of data engineers. They were like, well, we just want the data and analysts and data scientists to directly access it. That's why I put together this picture. And is many of these companies had to rehire and re-implement their data engineering strategies because I do think that as much as companies want to get rid of what they consider a bottleneck, which is data engineering, they must also admit that someone needs to manage and own these pipelines that create data sets that are actually understandable by analysts and data scientists. So yes, there are a lot of companies that are trying to remove data engineering as well as tooling that just wants to kind of eliminate or reduce the amount of need for data engineers, which kind of makes sense because there's not a lot of us out there. I think this is kind of proven by the difference in numbers when you look at the different subreddits for data science versus data engineering, but it often leads to problems and a lot of technical debt in the future. Um, and I think you're seeing this at a lot of companies. You can read some articles like the Airbnb article where they eventually had to start reinstating or just implementing a data quality and data engineering strategy because they just kept running into various problems. So it's a reality that uh, a lot of companies wanna get rid of data engineering to some degree or another, but it's also a reality that it is very, very hard to do so. So for those of you who wonder if DE is a good job choice, I would say we've got at least another decade of doing this work. Another great harsh reality that exists in the whole world of data engineering is as much as we like to think that everything is perfect and every company out there that has written an article about, you know, developing a perfect data lake or data lake house exists out there are just a lot of data swamps up there as well. And I've definitely had to go through a few of them. I had to work with one company where they were just dumping um, all of their files into an S3 bucket, no folders, no structure, no thing about time, like when something was dropped, it was just all of their uh, raw files into one S3 data bucket. There were thousands and thousands of files and there was very little ability to even search and figure out where and what file was just recently dropped. So it was definitely a chaotic mess and you don't even know where sometimes to start in those situations because you're 
just so flabbergasted that it happened. So there are tons of data swamps. And it's not just me who's posted this out there. In fact, I saw this hilarious uh, image on the data engineering subreddit covered a lot of these points. You know, if you look at this image, you can kind of see that, you know, data has just gone out of control. There's no real structure. Everything's just kind of stored in the data lake. There are just a lot of problems that arise from these situations where yeah, it's just kind of a data swamp. It is a reality that, you know, we try to go into this world where we're gonna move fast and create data and create value, but all that really ended up happening was we stuffed a bunch of data somewhere and we never really thought about the transform or how we're gonna like integrate it or all these other key things that data engineers do. So this is somewhat connected with getting rid of data engineers. Another reality that will never, I think, go away is just the ability for companies to actually know what data engineers and data scientists and data architects all should be doing. I was looking at a post on uh, the data engineering subreddit and I think it kind of covered this really well, you know, where they just kind of point out the fact that a lot of companies expect data people to do all data things. It's similar to if you were some sort of programmer before they kind of just expect you to do all technology things. You know, you should understand how to do database things and website things and backend things and front end things and networking things and Linux things and anything that has to do with, you know, a keyboard and a mouse and a terminal you should be able to do. And we're kind of in the same space now in the data world where everyone's just kind of expected to do everything, even if it's not what you're good at. And I like how they kind of point out here that a lot of people, especially people who are just breaking into the industry are using like high level YouTube videos. And I've definitely put out plenty of high level videos to kind of say that they are proficient in these skills. And most of these skills, even SQL are a lifetime skill. You can learn a lot of SQL in a year, but really it's just the surface. Uh, I really love that iceberg meme recently put out about SQL, but it really is so deep because it's not just about like SQL, it's also about the database engine underneath. Like, are you an expert in Oracle or SQL Server or Snowflake or Databricks or whatever solution you're picking? Because all of these even operate differently, at least in, to some degree. And obviously you need to, as a data person, be able to work on most of these, but to say that you're an expert on all of these, because there's just so much to know how to optimize each of these different solutions, how to make sure you're you know, writing a SQL in the best way, it's all going to be slightly different. So even if you know all of these SQL commands, there's just so much more to know. That's why I don't think I'll ever say that I'm a 10 in SQL. Whenever an interviewer asks, how good is your SQL? I'll probably always say like a six or a seven because every year there's some new skill or new concept that I'm like, oh, I didn't know this before. But yet companies still expect you to know everything because that's just the way the tech world works. It's like when you go to your parents' house and they're having an issue with the router and they expect you to fix it because for some reason you can write a few lines of Python. In these cases, it's important to know where your limit is. Uh, if you're new to any specific area, yes, you can kind of figure out some of it, but as soon as something gets deeper, it's probably not a bad idea for you to go to your manager or your director and just let them know that you're kind of out of your depth and either you need some training or maybe there needs to be someone else that comes in that is more senior because there's just too much in the data world for one person to know. That's why in a lot of my recent videos, I've definitely tried to like bring in other people's knowledge because there's just so much information and so much knowledge that's trapped in everyone's brains. And the more we can kind of get it out there, I think hopefully the more people can kind of glean and understand what exactly is going on in this whole data world. Finally, the last reality I think that's important just to understand is that you won't always get to use the new hyped and cool things that exist out there. And I think that's more than okay. Mostly because I remember when I first started out in the data world, I was working mostly on Oracle, SQL Server, Postgres, and a lot of things that were on-prem. At this point, a lot of companies were moving to like Redshift and Hadoop and I felt like really left behind. But the interesting thing was that as soon as I finally kind of started working with more uh, modern solutions, companies started to move away from Hadoop and even Redshift. Although Redshift is still, I think, very popular to use and even Hadoop at plenty of companies, just often in uh, a different form. It's not the end of the world, I think, to sometimes be on technologies that are a little bit older. One, you get to learn where a lot of like our best practices and solutions that we've developed over the last few decades have all come from. Why have we developed data warehousing the way that we have? Why, why in the world do slowly changing dimensions exist? Like all these things that you might just learn or read in a book, you can kind of 
understand a little more why they exist, why they're around, and, and why some people want to change them by using different modeling techniques. Whereas if you just kind of jumped into the modern world of data engineering and data modeling and things uh, in that space, you might not get all of the nuance from where we came from and why we're changing or, or at least trying to change or reapproach a lot of the problems that we've been looking at for the last few decades. So I just wouldn't get too stuck on the fact that, hey, we're using old technology, I'm falling behind. Because one, you're going to likely work with that technology at some point if it's worth working with. A lot of stuff is just a combination of marketing and hype and people FOMOing about not getting to use the new technology that everyone else is testing out. But I wouldn't worry about it too much and I would just make sure you focus on the basics and just get better at that. With that guys, I wanna say thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you next time. Thank you. And